Hi. I'm very honored and I have to say in a mixed feeling of embarrassment and excitement to be the first speaker of this important and uh, such needed uh, series of seminars. We have two students, Tommaso and Simone, who decided to, to devote their time, some economists would say some leisure time, to, to the organization uh, of this uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, they have all my admiration. I'm, I'm sure maybe there are also other students. I see all, a lot of uh, students from uh, the, the Laura Magistrale, from the Master. And um, I, I believe uh, other students have uh, supported this, uh, this, uh, this initiative. Uh, so they, they found that uh, the, the, the economic crisis was not uh, properly treated in the, the curricula at the master, the master level. As uh, a teacher of, uh, of, uh, of this master, I have to say, makes me to reflect a lot. And uh, uh, this uh, means that, uh, that something uh, has, uh, has to be changed. And, uh, and of course, uh, I'm also looking forward uh, to, to hearing the, the talk of, uh, of Emiliano Brancaccio, because I'm sure we'll have uh, to say some, um, some, uh, precises, uh, some precise uh, things about, uh, about, uh, about that. I have to say, I particularly liked, uh, in the title of the seminar series, uh, the use uh, of, the, of the term crisis and, uh, and critical. And uh, I copied <laughs> this, uh, this scheme, and I also uh, struggled uh, to put uh, the, the, these two terms in the title, critical and crisis. Someone told me, someone uh, who is much more expert than me in, uh, in ancient Greek, uh, that crisis and critical have the same uh, etymological uh, root. It comes from uh, the term crino, which means uh, to separate, to judge, to assess. And uh, indeed, uh, what we want to do, in, uh, what I want, would like to do in this, uh, in this talk, is to give uh, a general assessment of, uh, of the status uh, of, uh, of economics today from a methodological from a methodological point of view. Speaking of general assessment, uh, economics, and let's say macroeconomics in particular, is not in a good uh, shape. They didn't pr the, the standard models didn't predict uh, the crisis. Well, not only they didn't predict the crisis, they neglected uh, or even denied the very possibility of, uh, of, uh, of the crisis, of the financial, of the, of the bursting of the financial, of the financial bubble. They didn't uh, uh, predict uh, the consequences of, uh, of the bursting of the financial bubble, and they, don't, uh, they are not able to give uh, us uh, any policy advice to get out uh, from, uh, from the crisis. Who is saying that? They are not uh, only people from, uh, from the critical side uh, of the economics, from, uh, from the, the critical view of the economics. Nobel Prize uh, in, uh, in economics uh, saying that uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, uh, uh, Paul Krugman is, uh, is stating uh, these, uh, these things. And, uh, well, uh, this, uh, this uh, makes us to reflect also there is no trust uh, in macroeconomics and economics in general. There is no trust uh, uh, in the layman. Uh, the, uh, the man of the street uh, has no trust in economics. And you, well, you can perceive this even reading uh, magazines or newspapers like The Economist uh, or The Financial Times, uh, uh, which are not uh, uh, newspapers uh, or magazines uh, that, uh, that have been particularly critical to mainstream economics uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, decades. So, uh, so economics was a discipline which has which had uh, this uh, this uh, big ambition to be an objective science, to be very rigorous in its tools, and uh, which is now in a in a serious uh, state of uh, of disarray, and. Uh, I would like to point to put uh, now today the point of view of a methodology to give uh, a critical assessment uh, of that. I will talk about some uh, dilemmas in the methodology of economics. What is a dilemma? A dilemma is a situation 
in which uh, uh, you have uh, two, two roads and whatever road you take uh, it does not uh, give uh, you a satisfactory uh, solution. Uh, we talk about two horns of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a dilemma. I would like to talk today of the dilemma of causality, which I mean uh, causal inference. In, and uh, I, I sketch this dilemma as the, as the, the, the problem of being data-driven or, uh, or theory-driven. In the title, uh, I, I put some methodological dilemmas, which meant there are other dilemmas, but uh, I think in, uh, in 40 minutes now, I think it's 35 minutes, um, I think there is time only to talk about this dilemma. And, uh, but I uh, will try to make some connections to, to the other dilemmas, to at least mention which are the other dilemmas, which have to do with explanation, confirmation and uh, the general state of economics. So, causality. Well, uh, we know causal issues are very important in economics, but there, is, there is a variety of, uh, of questions uh, which touch uh, uh, causal issues uh, in economics. So one can ask, what is the cause of a recession? What is uh, the cause of the current recession, the cause of the current economic crisis? One may ask about uh, predicting the effect of a policy intervention. One can, can ask, what, is monet what, is the, what, what are the effects of monetary policy and fiscal policy in general in a market economy? One may have a retrospective or prospective, prospective causal question, which means related to the past or related to the future. One may think of the cause of a particular event or the cause of a set of events in general. We may ask, uh, we may ask uh, issues about measurement, uh, we like to estimate, uh, to give a number to the fiscal multiplier. Okay, so there are a variety of problems. So one can say, okay, why are you insisting on this issue? So it's, economics is all about uh, causal issues and we have to treat them empirically for each, uh, for each uh, problem. We will uh, have uh, some uh, tools uh, and so on and so forth. I claim here and argue here that notwithstanding the variety of, prob of problems, all these issues share a dilemma. And this dilemma uh, of uh, theory-driven and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and data-driven. So we face in our attempts, as uh, I say now, as empirical economists, as, em as economists, we face uh, this, uh, this dilemma in, uh, in our attempts to uncover causal relationship. So the first horn, so either we let theory guide us or we do not let theory guide us. If we let theory guide us, we build theoretical models. But our theoretical models, but uh, our theoretical knowledge uh, and the background knowledge upon which we build uh, theoretical models is uh, uncertain. At least there is no consensus on the assumption of, upon which theoretical models are built. It is easy to build models with conflicting policy implication by sometimes slightly modification of the initial condition. The other horn of the dilemma is that uh, we do not let theory guide us. We start from the data. We may estimate empirical econometric models from the data and we try to find evidence for causality from these models. Something like that is done in uh, VAR model, vector autoregressive models, the use of instrumental variables, the use of natural experiments and so on. We cannot guarantee that our conclusions uh, that our conclusions are true of the sample, and this is the problem of induction. But suppose we, we say, okay, problem of induction, okay, is a philosophical problem. Who cares about humor? Okay, but suppose uh, we get good evidence for, we say, okay, we don't get uh, really causality, but we get good evidence for causality. Well, without, I think without an understanding of the underlying uh, mechanism, it is difficult to generalize to other settings. Application is the problem of external validity. I claim this, uh, this dilemma had, uh, had been touched in several uh, uh, disputes uh, that we had uh, in the history of economic thought. 
Okay, it's not that all these disputes that uh, I list here are really only about this dilemma, but they touch uh, a lot of, uh, of things about that. Okay, I mentioned here John Stuart Mill uh, essay of uh, 1837 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and his critics. So Mill, uh, although was an inductivist from a point uh, of philosophical point of view, when, he's talking about, when he was talking about economics, was uh, defending a deductivist point of view. We should uh, let theory guide us. Mm. And was criticized by other people, Richard Jones in particular. The famous Methodenstreit eh, in the beginning of the 20th century between Karl Menger and the uh, historical German school. It was also, it was also such a, a thing. Okay. The, the famous controversy, this is more an econometrics uh, of the measurement without theory, which we have Burns and Mitchell, so people from the so called NBR approach, against um, Burns, Mitchell, and Vining against Koopmans uh, from the Cowles Commission approach. Then Cowles Commission approach versus Granger causality in the 80s. And now we have something like that in the, in the debate uh, about the mostly harmless econometrics uh, approach. Mostly harmless econometrics, a book by Engels and Pischke. Uh, and there was Deaton and Heckman, uh, which are quite polemic against, uh, against this approach. So solutions. Uh, well, uh, well, a solution, so uh, we have uh, these two horns uh, and uh, a solution uh, be to, to take both horns, to integrate bo both sources uh, of knowledge and searching for robust empirical and theoretical knowledge, making explicit the sensitivity problem. So that uh, when, we, when uh, we infer uh, causes uh, from, uh, from the data, we have to look at the sensitivity of a different theoretical assumption. And when we, 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 we take the other horn, the theory driven, we have to make, uh, we have to make sure that, uh, that uh, the, the, the assumption, we have to make sure that the, the, the conclusions are robust under different assumptions. But uh, this is not really, really satisfying. So I propose now to, to make a little bit a methodological detour in the sense of, uh, of philosophy. Of, uh, of science. So there is also a dilemma of, uh, of causations among the, the philosophers of science. So philosophers of science have asked about causation, since <coughs> Aristotle, I think. But in the recent uh, decades, uh, there was a lively debate about, uh, about, uh, about that, in the sense that in the, in the, since the, the 60s and the 70s of the last century, Scholars try to reduce, uh, uh, to, so to answer, because philosophers are more interested in the, in the question of uh, the definition of causality, what is causality, so the ontological question about what is causality, and of course also the epistemological problem of the causal inference. The idea was uh, to reduce causality to something else, so one idea was to reduce it to, to regularities uh, or to probabilistic uh, relationship. Another attempt has done to reduce causality to counterfactual relations, to intervention. So A causes B if we are able to intervene in A and have an effect on B, on mechanistic account. So mechanistic accounts mean causality has to be reflected in some mechanism. Each of these accounts has problems, counterexamples, so I no, don't want to go through this. And, uh, and so one possibility to have a pluralistic view, say all of these indicators matter. And, um, and there is now, in the, in the recent year, this, uh, what we may call inferentialist or epistemic, uh, or epistemic account about, uh, about causality, which means that uh, causality is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a feature of our representation of, uh, of, the, of the world. Uh, and we have to take into account uh, not just one indicator, the probabilistic one, for example, but several indicators. It, it, it is uh, quite, uh, quite convincing, or it, it offers, uh, I think, uh, some interesting uh, insights. Let's talk about the probabilistic indicators uh, in, uh, in economics. So these are scholars uh, who choose the second horn of the dilemma, so the data-driven approach, emphasize a lot the importance of the probabilistic uh, indicator. Christopher Sims, Nobel Prize, I think, 2011, let us, the data speak for themselves, was, uh, 
was uh, his, uh, his, uh, his slogan, eh? and he proposed this VAR approach, the Granger causality approach. The idea is to start from probabilistic relationship, probabilistic association, and uh, to find out something which looks like uh, causality, Granger, which uh, also a Nobel Prize, by the way, in 2004, who was, I think, a quite serious a scholar, didn't uh, dare to call it uh, causality, so let's call it something else. He proposed Wiener causality, yeah? and, uh, but everybody was calling it uh, Granger causality. Yeah, according to Granger. So it's not exactly causality, it's a little bit less than causality. There is a sloppy issue here, implicit causality. Okay, the idea is okay. We start from the data, we find out uh, mm, statistical associations, but it's not uh, really, it's really, it's really causality. And, uh, and the results of the problem of the hidden background theory. So here I have uh, an example of the famous, or I should say, infamous paper by Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff, which is very famous for this coding error. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to, to mention this coding error. It is interesting now uh, the fact that uh, they avoided completely the term causality. Uh, by the way, this also was typical of Milton Friedman uh, in, the, in, this, in the 60s, and the end of the 60s. There is a this, uh, this paper by James Tobin in 1970, called the Journal of Economics, which is, has the title Money uh, and Income Post Hoc Ergo Procter Hoc. So it was, uh, the idea was uh, well, you are not, uh, dear Friedman, you are not really to find out the causality between in your book with, uh, with Anna Schwarz, you are not really finding out causal relationship between, uh, between uh, money and income, you are finding out just. Uh, just correlations, basically. And the uh, freedom of saying, well, uh, I don't care about causality. Well, I think causality is a bad idea in science. You have to think that the, it was uh, this, uh, this uh, spirit of the time, right? In the first uh, half of uh, the 20th century, and I think had the influence of Friedman as well, in which we could, the idea was, was the typical idea of Bertrand Russell, we, we, we can do science without, without, uh, without causality. Uh, well, what uh, Reinhard and Roger are writing is our approach is decidedly empirical. Our main feeling is that across both advanced countries and emerging markets, high debt ratio, high debt to GDP ratio levels, 90% and above, are associated with notably lower growth outcome. And this what was used. Uh, for uh, austerity, austerity, austerity policies. So we say, okay, we don't really find out causality, but then uh, uh, other people, uh, because they find out uh, some, uh, some statistical association, they use it for policy intervention, so they are interpreted causally, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, in this uh, statistical association, which, by the way, were not particularly well done from a rigorous statistical point of view, as uh, Herndon, Herndon was, Thomas Herndon was this famous PhD student uh, from the University of Massachusetts, which found uh, this coding error. And, um, but there is not only that. This, they claim, so Herndon uh, and the quarter say, selective exclusion of available data coding errors and inappropriate weighting of some summary statistics lead to serious miscalculation that inaccurately represent the relationship between public debt and GDP growth among two anti-advanced economies. So there was a problem of, uh, of uh, selection, uh, not only of these uh, errors, which is from an ethical point of view, of course, uh, a very serious problem, but also prompted that they built up uh, a bad measure of, uh, of, statistical, <coughs> of statistical dependence. One important indicator of causation is probabilistic independence. Don't deny that, okay? I actually I argue the opposite. We should look for statistical dependence. We know correlation is not causation, more in general, because correlation is nothing else than the linear 
measure of statistical dependence. More in general, statistical or probabilistic use this term interchangeable. Statistical probabilistic dependence is not causation. What is statistical dependence? Intuitively, two random variables, x and y, are statistically associated, that is, dependent, if the realization of x gives useful information about it, the likely realization of y. This is not uh, a definition you find in the statistical text. This is something to put uh, them in words to give the intuition of statistical dependence. I think uh, this intuition uh, would be shared both by Bayesian uh, statisticians and frequentists. The definition is, uh, is, uh, is the, the, the following line. Statistical dependence is a property of the distribution function. Okay? You don't have this factorization. If you have this factorization of the joint distribution function, you have independence. If you don't have, you have statistical dependence. But it's not immediately from the data. So you, from the data, you, you may find different statistical models. You don't observe a statistical distribution. You estimate a statistical distribution. You have to think of the data generating process that creates this data. And, uh, well, there are different measures of statistical dependence. Correlation is one example. I put the form here linear regression coefficient, Granger causality. One important difference between statistical dependence and causality is that statistical dependence is symmetric in the sense that if x and y are. St is if x is statistical dependent on y, y is also statistical dependent on x, although the measure of statistical dependence can be asymmetric, like regression coefficient, if you regress from y on x, you get a different number if you regress x on y. But if they are statistical dependent, they are statistical dependent, both in a symmetric way. Well, Granger causality is not uh, symmetrical, but because it, Granger put uh, the time things, okay, so the future cannot cause the past. Causality is asymmetrical. In which sense statistical dependence uh, is... Uh, so I sh should finish at 5 o'clock, right? Okay. Which sense statistical dependence is an indicator of, uh, of causality? Well, there is this principle of common cause. It is from... Uh, by Reichenbach, who was a, a, a physicist and, uh, and philosopher of science of the 50s. If x and y are statistically dependent, he was saying either x causes y, y causes x, or there is a common cause z causing x and y. But actually there is also the, the following possibility. x and y are prima facie statistically dependent, but they result in this way because of a not adequately specified statistical model. What I'm, what I'm saying here. So I'm saying that... Uh, if you take the data, you measure a correlation. Okay. A correlation is a simple measure of statistical dependence. It can be that uh, the statistical model, uh, which is behind this correlation, because correlation is always measured <coughs> through the lenses of the statistical model, through the lenses of a probability <coughs> distribution, is, uh, is bad. It's a not adequate specification of what? Of the data generating process. Because where, where do statistical dependence come from in, uh, in economics? I mean, in economics, uh, in a social science, they come from a causal structure of the world. I mean, if you believe they are, uh, what, what we observe a correlation between uh, in, uh, in, in inflation uh, and income. Where do they come from? They come from because there are some causal structure, some interactions of, uh, of even complex uh, uh, economic agents that, that give that rise uh, uh, that, uh, that give rise to it, such, uh, such, uh, such measures. So there is causality behind them, is, is a co the causal structure which is generating a statistical, a statistical structure. And, the, and the, if you don't specify, so the statistical model correctly specified, if it mirrors some way, it mirrors somewhat the, the, the data generating process. So it is crucial to correctly specify statistical model. How to do that? Okay, here, there is a tradition in econometrics, uh, which sometimes has been uh, referred to as the London School of Economics approach, which is quite rigorous. So, some names, David Hendry, Eris Panos. Okay, there is a tradition in which, uh, in which, they, in which they, they make clear, it's called sometimes the general to specific approach, the general to specific methodology, that in which uh, you have to make clear that a statistical model uh, <laughs> does not come from uh, does not come uh, from nothing. I mean, you have to, to 
to to identify it through severe severe testing and and I think uh, it is a good idea to integrate here theoretical and background knowledge okay why you should integrate the theoretical and background knowledge because if you have some uh, some guidance of what the causal structure can be, you exclude the nonsense correlation. Uh, let, me be, let me make a, a simple example, not even from economics. I mean, th if there is a, a, a correlation, uh, you take the data on, uh, it wasn't made by philosopher, by the way, Elliot Sober, you take the correlation between the level uh, of the sea level in Venice, you take the data on sea level of Venice and the bread price in UK. And you observe a correlation, just uh, making the estimate of the data. Well, I claim here, this is not a problem of correlation. This is a problem of a bad statistical model, okay? You have to take into account if these are two time series. These two time series maybe have a unit root. They are non-stationary. So it's not a good idea to, to, to run a correlation estimation of these two data. Maybe you have to look... Uh, and co-integration and so on. This is uh, the idea of the LSC, what we can call London School of Economics approach, and which uh, now is also people like Caterina Uselius, Kevin Hoover insist a lot about that. There was also a recent paper on the, on the American economic group. So yes, uh, the last line. So the, the, the particular of economics and social science is this, that the st statistical dependence are generated by, by social structure, by interactions. It's not like, like physics in which you can talk about, uh, no, in quantum mechanics, you can talk about uh, correlation uh, which are not given by, by causation, right? Uh, well, it's, it's a little bit different from quantum mechanics in this sense, economics. There are social structures behind that which generate uh, the statistical, statistical dependence. So, yes, the bottom line so was, uh, was a little bit this... Uh, this, uh, this integration when you build a statistical model. So you have to use somewhat uh, your knowledge of the possible mechanism to use it to build a statistical model. Other indicators, but uh, as I said, uh, it, is a, well, it is a mistake. Uh, I was saying there is a problem of trust in economics. So people don't really trust economics. Because uh, it's, it's also a question of to believe, right? Uh, so to believe that, that there is a causal relationship, if you show just uh, statistical dependencies, it's difficult to convince someone of, uh, of, the, causal, of, uh, of uh, the existence of a causal structure. You have to show something like, uh, well, maybe an intervention, I intervene here and I have an effect. Or maybe you have to show something like a mechanism. Hmm? Counterfactual dependence. Counterfactual dependence is used a lot in, uh, in law. I think is used a lot uh, in cases of tort law, criminal law. You want to show you want to show X causes Y. Well, you have to think uh, in a way. You have to to give like a, a story that if X had not happened, Y would not have happened either. Okay. Well, it can be used in thought experiments, but uh, it's more that the fact that the counterfactual dependent, which is dependent on causal reasoning that the other way around. So let's talk a, a little bit now about interventions and mechanisms. Okay, so evidence about interventions and evidence about uh, mechanisms. At, uh, at the end, in economics, uh, we can intervene. Well, not much, but let's talk about that. So there is a, the idea here that uh, the idea of, uh, of causation as manipulation is that uh, if you X causes Y if the manipulation of X will result in a manipulation of Y. John Stuart Mill, so a very important uh, economist and philosopher, in, uh, in 1837 insisted on the impossibility of running controlled experiments in economics. Oh, if we had an experiment, we intervene here, we manipulate X, and we, we see if there is a, a result in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Y. The impossibility of running control experiment is not seen uh, as insurmountable by people like Havelmo, for example, 1944. Well, the idea is that nature can run experiments for us. There are, uh, there are a variety of independent sources of variation. And if these sources are independent, uh, well, they will conform to some well-defined distribution. For example, 
thanks to the law of large, uh, a large number, if you, if you have independent sources, uh, there will be a conformity to the Gaussian distribution. The situation is similar to what in epidemiology have uh, like a randomized control trial. You want to see if, uh, if a medicine is effective, you give, uh, you give, uh, uh, you divide, uh, you have two groups of people in which each group uh, is completely randomized in terms of, uh, of other characteristics that can, uh, can have an effect on, uh, on, uh, on the subject. And you give to one group uh, uh, the medicine, to other group a placebo. And you see what is the average, the average effect. In mostly harmless econometrics, I was quoting, if I was mentioning before, Angus Pischke claimed that exploitation of natural experiment, a random assignment of treatment independent of potential outcome, has induced a, a credibility revolution in empirical economics. They say much of the research we do attempts to exploit the readily available sources of variation. We hope to find natural quasi-experiments that mimic a randomized trial by changing the variable of interest while other facts are kept balanced. Can we always find a convincing natural experiment? Of course not. Nevertheless, we take the position that a notional randomized trial is our benchmark. Well, I claim also here, without an understanding of the underlying mechanism, so if you, if you just look for natural experiments, uh, this is not completely convincing. Uh, it is reduced to knowledge of, uh, of, of con conditional statistical dependence in this case. If you, so is, if you don't show what is the mechanism behind that, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult uh, to, co to, to, be, to, be, to, be, to be convincing. So you may even in the sample, I mean, I'm not saying that only the problem of validation. Say, okay, we have an experiment with this subject, we have a problem of validation, we don't know if it is valid to other subjects. No, even within, uh, within the sample, because at the end it's, uh, it's statistical uh, evidence what you, what you get. It's evidence of, uh, of statistical, uh, conditional statistical dependence. Mechanism. Mechanist account of causation. If X causes Y, we expect it to be a mechanism from X to, to Y. Okay, so also uh, theoretical models are built uh, with uh, some ideas of the underlying mechanism. A mechanism is something which can be decomposed into parts, which transmit a causal message, such that the transition from one part to another is governed by some, by some understandable principle. Okay, now in economics there is this uh, pernicious <laughs> idea, this pernicious idea in mainstream economics, that understandable means... Uh, it has to be reduced to rationality of the agents, okay? And that rationality means uh, optimal, uh, optimal location. So I understand the mechanism only if I can say, here there is an optimal location, otherwise I don't understand, okay? Here there is, a, and uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, wrong, a wrong idea. This idea is at the heart of the DSG models, uh, seen responsible for the failure of academic economy, economics in the face of crisis, for example, by, for example, by Colander and quotes by Butters and so on. So this is uh, uh, the uh, people uh, who, who have stressed the importance of mechanism are people who are more on the other horn of the first horn of the lemon, the theory-driven, theory-driven approach. So it's a, the DSG models is a very theory-driven uh, approach. And here, econometrics, uh, by the way, so it's not that if you, if you do something econometrical, so you do something uh, empirical. No, I mean, not in the sense uh, of, uh, I mean, uh, you, uh, economics has been on, on, uh, on calibration, so you try to calibrate the model. You know already what are the causal relationships. Okay, the theory dictates you what are the causal relationship. You use data to measure this uh, this uh, this uh, this, uh, this causal relationship. There is no estimation. There is no testing. There is no severe testing at all. This is connected uh, somewhat. Uh, I mean, no. This is very connected uh, with other dilemmas that we have uh, in uh, in the methodology of economics. Uh, they read what we may call the, well, dilemmas now in a more rhetorical sense, in the sense that there are some riddles, some conundrums in the methodology of economics. Like, for example, abstractions 
versus uh, idealization. So if, uh, if I want uh, uh, to explain there is, uh, this idea, I have to use model uh, which are abstract, I have to take something out, this was also the idea of John Stuart Mill, because the reality is too complex. Okay? I have to make some abstractions, but in Mill there was this idea that the models are true in abstract, so they are literally false, but the, the models should capture some, some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some causal, uh, some causal, uh, some, co some causal structure. The, the idealization is uh, not only that you take things out, but you idealize. And this is a very subtle issue. It depends how you idealize. Okay, you, you think of a market in which uh, uh, there is a natural rate of, uh, of, uh, of unemployment. Okay, it is, uh, or you, you, you think uh, we have the situation in which agents uh, optim we have agents we, who live uh, an, an infinite period of time so, and are able to maximize intertemporary. These are idealization. And uh, how can I say? They are not, uh, it, is, uh, it is important where they, where, where they, where they come from. Uh, and uh, they are, so it is much connected with. Uh, with uh, with this dilemma of, uh, of causality, because it, to some idealization, you, you are completely, you are completely theory, theory driven, right? You are completely theory driven and you have to discuss what is uh, the implicit uh, theory behind that. It's not innocent, it is, uh, it is, uh, it is idealization. Empirical validation, so falsifiability versus calibration. Also here, falsifiability is a different issue in economics, uh, we know it's also here was the idea of John Stuart Mill, we know it's, it's very difficult uh, uh, to, to, to test economic theories, to falsify them, so a Popperian approach is quite complicated in economics. But this, uh, does this mean that um, we should abandon any attempt to make uh, severe testing in economics? So the pe people who believe in calibration, so believe in this, uh, so it's much connected also with the dilemma of causality, but people who believe in calibration think uh, that uh, you should, uh, you can uh, uh, abandon this idea of, uh, of falsification because it's too complicated uh, and uh, you calibrate just a moment. So the, the third issue, so I'm quite, <laughs> I can say, I'm quite uh, impressionistic here, I'm not, uh, I'm just giving some, uh, some, uh, some ideas of how the dilemma of causality is connected with, uh, with other uh, methodological dilemma. But there is this last dilemma, moral science. Economics is a moral science, a natural science, a practical science. I was saying at the beginning, there was this ambition in economics, if you read John Stuart Mill, if you read, the, for example, Milton Friedman in the Nobel Prize, uh, how is it called, Nobel Prize speech, uh, I think it was 1976, uh, there was this idea of objectivity of, science, of, uh, of economics. So economics uh, has uh, uh, the... Has, uh, is, Economics has um, the status of a science like, uh, like physics because it's empirical and can be objective. Um, while economics was coming from moral philosophy, eh, and Adam Smith uh, was, uh, was still uh, a moral philosophy, and there is also this idea of, uh, of uh, economics as problem solving. We find it a lot in Keynes, economics. Uh, as a, as a problem solving, uh, economics as engineer. Uh, it's also Gary Mankiw's work uh, some years ago, uh, an article, Macroeconomics, Macroeconomics as engineer, something like that. Well, I believe uh, there are also here some, uh, some issues to connect with this, uh, with this, uh, with this causality dilemma, because uh, when, and with the other dilemmas as well, when you do well, natural science, but if you, do, if you use abstract models, if you do idealized models, you have to think why you are idealizing this, uh, this feature of the reality. Why are you taking out other things? So you have a the natural rate of unemployment and you, 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 you focus on an idealized market in which there are no conflicts and, uh, and, and so on. Why are you doing that? Okay, so it's not the, so the idea of uh, economic and social science as natural science is, a, is, a, is, a, is justified with this distinction between facts and values, right? 
But facts and values are very intertwined uh, in economics. So moral science, I, would, I could have written political science. So, so economics is not only a natural science, uh, it's also very much intertwined with, uh, with uh, a political philosophical approach. Uh, and also it has this, uh, this uh, side of, uh, of uh, problem solving that has to give uh, guidance of problems that you have in the society right now. Conclusion. Three please. <laughs> I will conclude with, uh, with three please to reorient economics in the, in the face of crisis. So we need to have a critical view in uh, two quite different meanings. Now there is uh, like an atomic bomb because they put a Popperian sense and Marxian sense given the, the contempt uh, and lack of admiration that Popper had uh, for Marx, uh, this mixture <laughs> will, uh, will, uh, will, will uh, cause an explosion. But um, I mean that uh, we, we need a critical view in, uh, in two quite different meanings, in the sense of Popper, severe empirical testing. Notwithstanding the difficulties of falsificationism, we need severe empirical testing of, uh, of, uh, of uh, how theoretical policy. Marxian sense. We have to debunk implicit assumption. Okay, why we have to unmask the reason why you decided to abstract? Uh, why you decided to idealize in this way? I understand economics is complex. The economy is a complex. It's very complex. Economics, is a com uh, but you have uh, to explain. Uh, and uh, as a critical economist, uh, you have to criticize this attitude to focus on a particular direction, to focus on particular causal structure, uh, taking out uh, other, which can be important. Which uh, and uh, w important, what does mean? Important uh, is not an answer of true and false. It's a, of good and bad. And this political philosophy then can tell you. So it's, uh, it's uh, the political and, uh, and the moral side of a philosophy, which can t of economics, which can tell you if this idealization is, uh, is good or bad. Okay. More pluralism. More pluralism in the sense uh, of, uh, of uh, use of assumptions. So we have to consider that uh, you may have uh, different assumptions behind the model and you have to be quite pluralist. But uh, I would refuse uh, an attitude of, of the anything goes. Anything goes was this uh, slogan by, uh, by Feyerab and Paul Feyerab in the 75, okay? He said that uh, any method is okay, okay? No, here, we, I mean, we have to find uh, the right one uh, and that this has to be informed by, uh, by political philosophy. So rethinking of the fact-values distinction, the failure, uh, as I was mentioning before, the failures of economics as an objective science uh, is also a failure of an idea of objectivity. Objectivity, objectivity, sorry, objectivity. So the idea of objectivity is behind John Stuart Mill, Milton Friedman, is wrong. Okay, what's the idea of uh, an autonomous uh, economic and autonomous discipline completely autonomous from the moral philosophy. Uh, this, is, uh, this idea of objectivity has been completely put uh, in, uh, in disarray in troubles by the current crisis. Okay? This idea of objectivity, objectivi objectivity is, is wrong so because it's not able to give you an objective science. Sometimes when I teach the methodology of economics, people ask me, so what kind of science is economics, okay? There is this nice quotation of Keynes, which, uh, which uh, suggests that there are three, these three aspects, the political aspect, the natural uh, science aspect in terms of rigor, of severe testing, what they call the Popperian attitude, and uh, the the practical man attitude, so solving problems. Okay, so I conclude with, uh, with this quotation of, of, uh, of Keynes. He was talking ab about actually Alfred Marshall, but I suppose he was talking about, uh, about him uh, himself. Okay, but uh, there is, a, so I don't read it, you can read it alone, but uh, there is these uh, three aspects, mathematician, historian, statements, 
philosopher in some degree. Okay, so there are all these uh, all these aspects of the three 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 souls of, uh, of economics. I think I conclude here. Thank you very much for your attention.